Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Arun Radhakrishnan. I'm a family doctor with a focused practice in chronic pain, uh, working up in Ottawa. But for today, I'm down here in Toronto with a team at CEP. Um, and so it's my pleasure to present with the group here um, the next, uh, or this webinar, which will be covering integrating management of chronic non-cancer pain into the, pri into the primary care setting. So the objectives for this webinar are to provide you a brief overview of our uh, tool so, and, uh, pr and present some of the key pieces of that tool, which is a baseline assessment and follow-up visit forms. Uh, the tool we're talking about here is the EMR version of the uh, chronic non-cancer pain uh, paper version of the tool that's available through the Center for Effective Practice. Uh, we hope to be able to discuss how you can implement it into your practice and answer uh, some key questions that any of you may have. So just to, in terms of getting us going, uh, we thought it would be good to sort of uh, cover some basic concepts about the tool itself. And so the purpose of this tool was to help family physicians and nurse practitioners to develop and implement a management plan for adult patients with chronic non-cancer pain. So that gives you a sense around uh, whom the tool was designed for and in which populations we were intending for the tool to be used. Uh, the, the tool really uh, works on trying to emphasize uh, a multimodal approach to chronic non-cancer pain management versus the classical unimodal approach. Uh, primary care providers uh, are emphasized to use non-pharmacological options with or without pharmacolo pharmacological options where appropriate to build a comprehensive and personalized plan that ensures that incorporates the patient's goals as well. Uh, for the purposes of our discussion, uh, chronic non-cancer pain, or CNCP, is, uh, is defined as pain that typically persists or recurs for more than three months or past the time of normal tissue healing, and these are, the, these are fairly standard definitions that we see from the IAST. So a couple of highlights uh, to keep in mind as you're using the tool, that uh, the tool is not really designed for the management of acute pain, uh, so more on chronic pain. Uh, the tool is also designed not to diagnose various chronic non-cancer pain conditions, such as fibromyalgia, chronic daily headaches, uh, neuropathic pain syndromes, but rather the focus is on management of those conditions. Uh, another caveat we'd like to bring up is that the tool is not particularly des well designed or structured to take on the management of chronic pelvic pain, and so that is out of scope for the tool. And there are a number of reasons for that, including the complexity and uh, some of the differences that are associated with the management of chronic pelvic pain. So with that, we're going to start to dive into uh, the first part of the tool, which is the baseline assessment. So the baseline assessment part of the tool is a custom form that we created with the hope uh, that all patients living with chronic pain would receive a baseline assessment. However, we recognize that there are some barriers to a comprehensive, extensive baseline assessment. Uh, one of them, of course, is the short appointment times that we see in primary care, um, and also recognizing sometimes these patients are double booked, uh, and sometimes these uh, appointments take place in a walk-in type setting. We also uh, acknowledge and understand that it's oftentimes rare that a patient comes in for a singular purpose, uh, and that oftentimes they may have a competing purposes, such as a uh, upper respiratory tract infection or a urinary tract infection. So there may be a number of other uh, challenges or difficulties that the patient is coming from. Um, and oftentimes, patients don't necessarily come in for a comprehensive assessment uh, around chronic pain uh, unless they're necessarily being prompted to do so. So the, continuing on, this form has been designed for you to be able to complete it uh, at multiple stages. So it isn't necessary to complete the form all in one shot. You can complete some components of this and then come back to complete the form as you move along. Um, <clears throat> now, what are some opportunities that you can use the baseline form in? Um, so if a patient comes in with a particular or a dominant discussion point around pain and you've identified that it's chronic non-cancer pain, uh, you can begin to complete some of the key sections of the baseline assessment, and we'll touch upon that shortly in some of the screenshots that we have, and have them come back uh, after you've done some basic completion of the baseline assessment on future visits and fill in the form at a future date. 
Now, it's important to highlight that uh, when you do go back to fill in the baseline assessment, uh, it will populate for you into your follow-up forms at future visits from there. So whatever you put into your baseline visit, uh, when you fill in the follow-up visit forms, will be populated into that. So here are some features we'd like to highlight for you in the EMR forms that you'll encounter. So you'll see this green eye to the, to the right, and you'll see that more uh, in a number of different places in the tool. We encourage you to click on it to be able to identify the extra and additional information that, it's, uh, that it hopes to provide. You'll also see uh, the two talking heads, we can say here, and we call them our talking points. And really what it is is uh, some guidance that we hope to provide or some support for our clinicians around what we call talking points, especially when there are some challenging conversations uh, that may be associated with uh, implementation of certain therapies or perhaps even jumping into or diving into uh, papering discussions that may come up. You'll see also through the forums uh, hyperlinks to supporting materials, uh, especially resources or, um, or uh, documentation uh, for both providers and patients that you could potentially even print out and add into uh, uh, discharge planning or discharge uh, discussions for the patient. And here is the EMR form for the baseline assessment. So you can see up in the top, uh, on the second line, the green eye that we talked about. Uh, you can see the hyperlinks down with the wellhealth.ca. You can see how we've tried to structure the baseline assessment into discrete elements here, pain summary, patient history, uh, substance use history, and opioid use disorder risk assessment, physical examination. And that's more from an assessment side. And we get down into the management side, treatment goals of the patient that's identified uh, together. Um, then, of course, emphasizing non-pharmacological therapy, non-opioid pharmacological or medication therapies, opioid therapies where appropriate, and then again, additional uh, um, management or plan notes that you need to make that may pertain to things such as uh, insurance discussions or forms or um, uh, disability forms or whatever it may be that you and the patient have uh, added into their management discussion. So, this is the... Uh, EMR, form. so continuing on with that baseline assessment form, we've expanded out the pain summary. Now, if you recall in the previous slide, there were some pluses and minuses, when you, and you can see that in this form as well. The pluses will expand each section, the minuses will collapse each section, and so under the pain summary form, you see that it is expanded out now. You can uh, identify some established pain diagnoses, you can make on the left with the check boxes, headache, osteoarthritis, on the right side, you can document what is their primary visit, reason for a visit, uh, increasing pain or increasing discomfort, new area for pain and discomfort, for example, if it's fibromyalgia. You can, of course, we have some prompts for you uh, around location, duration, character from a, character, from a documentation perspective. We highlight uh, chronic um, complex regional pain syndrome as being an urgent issue to address, particularly if it is a new or emerging diagnosis. You see the CRPS criteria as a hyperlink, so if you click on that, you will see the diagnostic criteria for that to support you in helping identify if this is potentially a CRPS diagnosis. Um, we have tracking of the brief pain inventory for you there, and of course, we try to keep it as flexible as possible with some open text boxes like additional comments and, uh, and such. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, so again, uh, with this slide, you can sort of see we've tried to pre-populate it. We've ticked off headaches. We've ticked off, we've ticked off low back pain, myofascial pain. And you'll notice there's open text boxes also along with each one of those diagnoses that have been checked off that allow you to add in more detail uh, at your choosing. So whether locations or when it was diagnosed, whatever details you feel are relevant, we would encourage you to enter in there uh, to help make sure that the documentation makes sense for you. Now, in this uh, screenshot, we've clicked on the eye uh, to give you a sense of what yeah, the eye, the information button can give you. And here, really, what it's representing is the uh, description of the tool, what it's meant to be, what it's meant to do, and what are some of the limitations of the tool itself or the intended audience of the tool. 
So this is the uh, a form. So, so exa for example, in the previous section, we had the, if you notice, the brief pain inventory, um, which is noticeable right here. And if you click on this little hyperlink, it takes us into this form here. The brief pain inventory provides an opportunity for us uh, to be able to measure not only the pain scores for a patient, but also some of the function scores or the interference scores, which are in, uh, I think, the emerging sense here equally important uh, in, the ma in helping uh, monitor and track the management of a patient's uh, chronic pain. Um, I believe the next slide identifies and shows that we can click off different parts of the brief pain inventory, which will then be saved into the record. Um, and of course, we can track pain scores and interference scores, which are automatically calculated for us, as you can see down here. We've got a severity score, we have an interference score, and all of those will be populated into your uh, record so that you can track them and watch them over time. So we're going to move on to expanding into the next section, which is the patient history. And in this, we can see uh, the comorbidities is the first section. We've ticked off depression as a comorbidity for this patient. We also have, you see here, PHQ-9 and GAD-7 uh, forms, much like the brief pain inventory form that we just showed you. And they will be tracked here so that you can not only see the current numbers, but over time you'll, able to see, you'll also be able to see uh, numbers from previous visits as well. We'll have, there's a similar format in the follow-up assessment as well. Uh, as you walk through the rest of the form, you've got uh, past pain-related investigations and call consults. You have current and previous pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments. This gives you an opportunity to track the different things that have been used. Uh, for And even if you go into the future, if you, for, for example, utilize, let us say, amitriptyline, uh, your patient has poor or no benefit from it or has side effect from, from it, you could potentially uh, track that information here if you choose to. But also, of course, you can track it within the CPP as well. Uh, we encourage uh, to take a robust uh, mental health history as well <clears throat> with past psychiatric diagnoses as well as family psychiatric history diagnoses. Uh, we encourage a functional social history that look at both supports from a family and social perspective, their work engagement and status, and also being able to look at and talk about sleep, uh, which is especially important both from a pain perspective as well as monitoring how patients are responding to various medications as well. And as always, we adhere to that concept of flexibility and not having additional comments at the bottom of the slide, at the bottom of the page as well. Uh, on the right here, you have what we call biomedical. We have yellow flags. Uh, we have biomedical yellow flags, psychiatric yellow flags, and social yellow flags. You can document these as well. Uh, we encourage you to document these. They provide you uh, a bit of a sense, a sense or sensibility around where or which patients may require more intensive uh, interactions and intensive therapies or focus on therapies to be able to uh, advance or move forward on functional goals. Um, so what do I mean by intensive? Intensive may mean that they may need to be seen by you a little bit more often, or they may uh, need uh, to have more one-on-one -on -one interactions from a psychiatric perspective uh, rather than focusing on group-based interactions. Uh, this is, of course, again, uh, the PHQ-9 uh, forms that we talked about. You can see, you click it out, you fill it out, we, it scores for you and automatically gets populated into the EMR form. Um, oops. <clears throat> um, so in this one, you can see, is this a demonstration of the functionality of the yellow flags? You can see multiple site pain. It pops up. It gives you a little bit of a descriptor and information about what's been flagged there for you and the, uh, a little bit more information on what the yellow flag means in and of itself. So we'll move on then to the substance use history and opioid use disorder risk assessment. Again, to some this may be uh, quite uh, familiar, to others it may not be as familiar. Uh, here we, again, we look at opioid use disorders, identify the patients on an opioid. We do encourage uh, urine drug screens to be done on these patients, the frequency of which is always controversial at this point in time, but we do encourage at least one urine drug screen uh, done on record uh, and perhaps even once a year. 
Uh, we do make some suggestions here around what areas to uh, discuss around substance use issues, alcohol, illicit substances such as cocaine, heroin, to name a few, and of course any challenges or cha uh, problems they've had with prescription medication. So all prompts there to help you identify uh, and navigate an area that you may not be necessarily comfortable with. Uh, we have, of course, a section on risk assessment, and the risk assessment is in, in the context of the opioid risk, uh, really, is what we're looking at. With uh, Again, traditionally, we've uh, focused on the opioid risk tool. You can see it's a hyperlink there as well. It will be fillable much in the same way as other tools that we've identified. Uh, but keep in mind that there's a lot of controversy around risk, uh, opioid risk assessment, whether the opioid risk tool is the best tool to use. Uh, it is a tool to use, but not necessarily the only tool to use, and we'll encourage you to utilize your own judgment and the tool that you are most comfortable with to determine the risk assessment for a patient. Uh, stratification of risk between low, medium, and high, or low and high, um, can be based on other elements such as histories of anxiety, depression, PTSD, current and past history of op uh, opioid or alcohol use disorders. Uh, and ultimately, knowing that a patient is lower or higher risk really provides you an opportunity to determine should they or should they not be on opioids, uh, or if you are on opioids or thinking about going on opioids, making sure that you, you employ strategies to increase the safety of the patient, uh, both in terms of how much they're receiving, how often they're receiving their prescriptions, how often they're being screened and monitored. Um, and so again, we do pro uh, provide some information here onto the side to help provide some context and information on how to navigate uh, risk assessment. Um, so this is just a quick point around the urine drug screen. If you look back on this form here, you have a uh, ordered, conducted urine drug screen. If you click on that, it will pop up into here. You'll have uh, your EMR form, uh, which you get to click on into EF testing. Uh, you can determine the type of testing you're looking for. Uh, so we do distinguish between the two different types of urine drug testing. There's the immunoassay, which is the standard UDS testing we've identified there. We also identify confirmatory US UDS testing. So if there's some anomaly that shows up on the immunoassay that you are not able to clearly under, uh, identify or understand based on the history and what you have available, uh, confirmatory testing allows for chromatography, more, uh, which I then ultimately gives us a uh, more detailed uh, and confident analysis of what may be found in the urine. So you can pick between which one, and all of that gets populated accordingly. The, popul uh, the populations come down through here uh, at the bottom, uh, and you have a few more options. You can add pending tests to your form, so that gives you a, uh, it gives you reminders that there are pending tests. Um, and you can, of course, print off the form and then util and, uh, I guess just, uh, utilize it in the practice however you've structured your administrative processes. So moving along, we try to keep the physical exam examination component as flexible as possible, get you to report some basic vital signs. Again, standard examination pieces, which include musculoskeletal examination, neurological examination as prompts, but of course understanding that depending on the patient's pain uh, and what you are examining, you may have uh, a variety of different other needs to examine. And of course, remember these boxes are not just limited to the size, they will scroll and expand, so they do offer you as much space as you need to document. Um, <clears throat> moving along, here we are into the management goals or the treatment goals for the patient. You'll notice here that we've given you a prompt for four goals. You can go more if you want. It might be a little bit more challenging. You can go beyond four goals. Uh, we, we give you a tip around smart goals, really specific, measurable, agreed upon, realistic, and time-based. It's a guide for each one of those goals, that we want a goal to be smart. Uh, or, or otherwise we worry that uh, the likelihood of achievement of that goal may be hindered. Um, and now if you notice, as these goals you populate here, they'll be pushed forward into your follow-up uh, forms as well. And so here we just give you a bit of an example. Here's, you know, walk around the block three times a week. So that might be uh, a goal, not necessarily the goal everyone should form, but again, we really do encourage you to sit down and have a conversation with the patient and identify what their goals may be, and also keep in mind that goals don't also have to be around purely functional pieces. 
They can be around psychological pieces. They can be around hobbies and other activities that you may focus on. So uh, we move on then to the non-pharmacological therapies. In here, you'll note the lots of green eyes that are there for information. You'll also note some talking heads here. So there are some talking points that you can click into. Uh, you notice in each one of these different management categories, we've got sort of pre-populated text. Uh, this is a feature you'll see in our follow-up uh, pieces as well. The pre-populated text is there to sort of quickly tab through if you want to uh, and have it incorporated into the documentation so you don't actually have to write all of this out. Now, of course, if you haven't spoken about or touched upon any of these things, we encourage you to delete it, but otherwise keep it in if, it, if you have had an opportunity to touch upon it. And we hope that what this, these prompts give you is an opportunity to remember what are some of the key things that we want to keep encouraging our patients to think about and to talk about um, in terms of each one of these areas. So, you know, exercising regularly, looking at a variety of different exercise characteristics, uh, and of course educating and encouraging our patients to continue to engage with exercise, uh, psychological therapies, again, focusing on some of the evidence-based uh, therapies that we've looked at, cognitive behavioral therapies, acceptance commitment therapies, mindfulness-based interventions, um, self-management programs, encouraging, recommending, and following up to make sure our patients are engaging with and attending these sessions, and where applicable and appropriate physical therapies that may include modalities such as uh, manual therapies, TENS, to name a few. You'll see over here on the right side of the screen, uh, I think some probably one of the most important parts of this page, uh, which is some patient resources. We've got uh, Neuronova for mindfulness-based solution, uh, uh, solutions. Uh, we've got Introduction to Mindfulness for Chronic Pain, which is a web link to the YouTube site for Pain BC. Uh, similarly, Yoga for People in Pain, again from the Pain BC group. As you can see, they're prolific in their patient uh, materials. We've got eCouch, which provides a free CBT, uh, online CBT for patients out of Australia. Uh, and of course, some fact sheets on chronic pain to make sure that our patients have uh, valuable and important material to help them understand uh, some, of the, some of the challenges that are facing them. So again, all of these things you can click through and I think can provide some valuable information. Uh, this is just a demonstration of that talking point, and again, if you click on it any, at any point in time, this is a little pop-up that you'll get. Uh, so, for example, patients are reluctant to try physical therapy or activity. Uh, you could try, how do you feel about trying some exercise therapy? Uh, if I, and again, responses could be, if I understand correctly, you're concerned that physical activity will increase your pain. Interestingly, it may actually tend to do the opposite as physical activity over time can be an effective way of decreasing pain. What do you think about that? So really sort of a motivational interviewing type of approach to this to really uh, provide some discussion points, elicit some responses, and then respond accordingly, and hopefully bring both parties, yourself and the patient, to an agreement on what would be the best course, course forward. Our hope is incorporating exercise. Um, so here we are uh, again with some additional pop-outs. So each section you'll see a little bit more details on how to initiate, adapt, and evaluate each of the treatment act, uh, um, components, whether it's physical activity, psychological, self-management, or physical therapies. Uh, and again, these are when you click on the little eye icon will pop up this section for you, uh, which really just borrows directly from the paper-based tool to provide you a little more direction uh, on, as we said, uh, initiating monitoring. Things. And so these same features will be seen in the follow-up tool, as well, the follow-up form as well. Um, <clears throat> so now we get into the plans or the non-opioid medications. You can see here we've structured it so that you've got the box, you've got pre-populated areas. You can describe in your plan whether you're planning to start it, taper it, titrate, or maintain the medications, medication name, dose, length of trial. These are all pre-populated pieces to help you with uh, the speed and ease of, of um, entering in the information as well as prompts. Uh, to help us remember uh, what are some of the key informations or key pieces we need to talk about. Uh, of course, you know, discussing potential side effects, discuss potential benefits, and all, again, important pieces uh, that, we, that are part of uh, what we would hope would be standard documentation. And our hope there is that we recognize this is a lot to do, this is very challenging, and we're trying to, try, we're trying to make this uh, as, as accessible and as 
minimally painful as possible. Um, <clears throat> And again, when you do click through on the I here next to the plan on non-opioid medications, it does pull open this box, uh, which again pulls directly from the tool that provides some constructs and ideas and some direction around initiating, titrating, and evaluating the effectiveness and the value of the medication that you're proposing. Um, <clears throat> so now we get into the opioid medication component of the form, and as you can see, there are some talking points here. You have some little uh, warning signs here to draw your attention, uh, lots of little details, uh, and again, really trying to emphasize when, where, and how we should be using opioids. So there are some criteria uh, for, uh, that we suggest for when to start using opioids. Uh, we did, of course, put some good information here about uh, what is the evidence base around opioids and function for pain. Uh, we do then uh, ask you to sort of decide or select which best characterizes your pain, if your patient, is, uh, your patient, if they're currently on opioids, if they're not on opioids, um, or if they're not, if they don't warrant consideration for opioids right now. Uh, here you can see we've already pre-populated and clicked through into review current opioids, uh, if, um, and that gives you an opportunity to identify what are the different opioids that they're on, what are the dosages, and the date started. So again, that allows us to document and support the documentation of, the, uh, of what opioids may be used. And again, you'll notice and see that this is familiar from the previous section around the non-opioid pieces, same format, same structure, and the same hope and expectation of simplifying documentation. Uh, and again, here's the pop-up of what some talking points may be. Uh, so again, these might be some challenging discussions you may face. Patient wants opioids, but they're not clinically appropriate. Uh, so again, you may dump, dive into these various discussions, and we provide you these talking points to support you uh, if you find yourself needing that support or in a challenging or sticky situation. Uh, we do provide also an opioid uh, conversion table that's also been embedded into the tool. This is the most uh, recent or up-to-date table that we have. Uh, you'll notice, again, a variety of different opioids with their conversion factors. You'll also notice fentanyl and some conversion factors. And, of course, please do make note of the fentanyl conversion, uh, that it is a conversion from uh, current opioids uh, to fentanyl and not a conversion factor to be used from fentanyl back to uh, other opioids. Um, <clears throat> we do have, again, uh, some additional information around tapering of opioids, how to taper, tapering pearls. Uh, so again, uh, providing some basic preliminary information to help support you. Uh, if you do have more detailed questions, we also do encourage you to look at the tapering tool that is at the wellhealth.ca uh, that provides a little more in-depth information if you need it around tapering. Uh, and we, of course, provide some other information if you are going to be prescribing opioids around strategies to prevent opioid use disorder, uh, against risk stratification, identifying your high-risk patients, following strategies that you may be able to uh, minimize the potential a patient potentially developing OUD, or also a minimize or minimize some of the risk for them by continuing to monitor them with urine drug screens um, on a regular basis. <clears throat> now, with all opioids, again, we do need a treatment form, and so we have a, a proposed opioid agreement form that we have here for you. Some of them, some people may call this an opioid contract. We call it a treatment agreement form, uh, and again, uh, it provides some basic documentation for you to use, and it doesn't mean that this needs to supersede whatever you have in your own practices right now, but again, it's there for a convenience factor. So this is right at the bottom of that opioid piece. It's really highlighting some resources that are available. So we talked, we looked at the opioid conversion table, we looked at tapering medication, strategies to prevent OUD. So these are the things that we've popped up. They're all hyperlinks and they, were, they pulled up the windows that we've looked at in the previous few slides. At a patient level, we have some CDC pieces, we have uh, McMaster University's messages for patients, uh, some outstanding videos from Mike Evans. 
um, and ISMP, the Opioid Stewardship Program. So again, all documentation. Of course, the PDFs are easy to print off. Perhaps then the websites and URLs for videos are, uh, I think, extremely valuable to share with the patients and I think uh, can be quite useful in helping navigate their care. Um, <clears throat> additional plan notes provide us the opportunity to, as we said, document a number of different pieces that are captured in other areas. Again, we designed and put this in place based on feedback from clinicians like yourself around the need for flexibility. Uh, and of course, as you can see here, uh, it get, lets us know when are we following up um, and some other potential details that need to be put there in terms of work-related components. Um, <clears throat> All right, so now that we've done a deep dive into the baseline form, we'll now take the opportunity to go into the follow-up form as well. So you'll notice some of the structure of this looks hopefully somewhat familiar. Uh, you've got uh, your pain summary we talked about before. You'll notice here because in our baseline we clicked off headaches, low back pain, and myofascial pain. Uh, we clicked off depression in the past medical history, the comorbidities. You recall we filled in their brief pain inventory, their GAD7, their PHQ9. All of this information is just auto-populated for us based on what's been put into the baseline form. Uh, whatever's been put in here or whatever you modify or adjust in this form today will be populated into future follow-up forms as well. So we try to keep information rolling forward into the future. Um, that's the hope and hopefully that will be valuable to you. Uh, same thing if you pull up the biomedical, uh, the yellow flag section, which is review yellow flag, you'll see we had put in multiple pain sites from our baseline form, and it pushes through as well. And again, if you adapt it here, it will push through into future forms. Now, I will say this, due to some, due to a number of restrictions around our, um, around time, we were not able to create these forms to back populate into the baseline form. So what you do put in, in the follow-ups will not populate back into the, back, uh, into the baseline form. Uh, we're working on trying to correct this uh, in version 2.0 that will be coming out at some future date. Um, <clears throat> Again, this is again continuing to show the functionality of push through when we click off review substance use history and OUD risk assessment. Um, it does start to populate, it opens up our window down here and that's where you can follow this little lines, the dot and the lines that you're supposed to draw our eyes towards that uh, and gives us all of the information we will have entered into these areas as well. So again, look for the circle and the dot and the, and the line that follows to help us identify where the information is being presented. Um, and again, now we're kind of getting into those treatment goals, physical activity, psychological therapies. This is all the things you would have populated from the baseline assessment. All that we did populate from that baseline assessment in the forms that we've been showing you this morning was walk around the block three times a week, and so lo and behold, here it is. Um, of course, if we had put in other pieces here in these different sections, uh, physical activity, psychological therapy, self-management programs, um, uh, physical therapies as well, that would also be populated, but it isn't. Uh, you can see here patient resources. So you hopefully we're familiar with this, and this is sort of, again, a recurring theme that's there throughout. We, uh, we do encourage to continue to talk about and share these resources with patients on an ongoing basis if they need it. Um, same thing, when you do uh, click down into these areas and ready to start, uh, when you do click down into these areas, you're going to notice here a little piece at the top, insert stamp text, insert last note, and clear. Uh, so again, what you have here is an opportunity to decide what you want to do with those existing pages. So if you remember here, in this page, it's all empty, clear, we haven't got anything. Uh, if here, in this section, uh, what we're highlighting is these little buttons here. So if you say insert stamp text, what it'll do is provide you this pre-populated text that is there that you can click through and tap through as you need. If you say insert last note, it will actually populate what, whatever was there from the last note. We didn't have anything, so we didn't put anything. Uh, or you can say, you know what, whatever's there, whatever may have been populated or whatever is there, clear the whole thing. I'm done. don't want it. I want to do my own thing. So that's your choice, how you want to go about it and hopefully you'll find uh, all three, op one of those three options uh, uh, of value to you. 
So plan section uh, for non-opioid medications, again, you've got your stamp text here. You can add a medication, change a medication, look at various medication options, insert last note and clear, and that will help us populate accordingly here the type of text that we can click through and um, add in. Um, <clears throat> In this here, if you select a medication option, then the medication table will pop up uh, and help you, and you can help you provide you some information on what may be the most appropriate medication for your patient based on their pain types, uh, and of course, looking and thinking about what may be some contraindications or comorbidities that you need to uh, consider or think about. Uh, in this section here. Um, the information component also provides more, uh, provides some details on how to start a medication. So if you click on the I, pops open a box here. Uh, how you start it, how you can evaluate it in a sequential manner, basically identifies what a trial looks like for a given medication if it's a new medication. Um, again, so looking at the opioid medication subcomponent of the follow-up form, very similar in its follow in what it looks like. Uh, it, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of if any differences between our, this and the baseline form, and again allows us to continue to monitor and look at the medications or add or change the opioid as we see fit. Uh, again, information on tapering opioids, how to taper tapering pearls, very similar to what we've seen in the past, and these are the physician resources that we're focusing on. Um, and of course, the same thing, strategies to prevent opioid use disorder. So again, walking through what are the different pieces that are there. So again, really that's all the highlight for you, that the same support structures that are there in the baseline are also available for you in the tapering, sorry, in the follow-up part of the tool. Additional plan notes, again, same concept, insert standard stamp text, pull in your last note. If you're doing the same thing as last time and you don't really, and you're not changing a whole lot, put in the set, one click, auto-populate, off to the races. Um, <clears throat> so in this, what we're really kind of demonstrating is if you want to go back to the baseline visit or update it during a follow-up, you can use it at any point in time. The easiest way to scroll to there is you can use the table of contact contents function in the PSS, uh, to, in the PSS EMR, uh, and then sort of quickly jump over or jump up into the uh, baseline assessment tool. Uh, and so what, you know, what, what ultimately happens here is that, you know, when you have the patient in for a follow-up, you may walk through some of the key pieces. If you have an opportunity, either through the history or the story or some time, you may decide to go back and fill out the most critical, uh, fill out other parts of your baseline assessment. Uh, for example, you may go back and fill in with a little bit more detail some of the social functioning, some of their uh, personal function, work function elements. You may decide to go back and fill in some of the patient psychiatric history, some of the, uh, their, their family psychiatric history, sleep pieces, things that you may not have had an opportunity to get to at the first baseline assessment. So we'll stop there and we'll, we'll start to work on unmuting everyone. All participants are now unmuted. So like I said, I know that was a lot of content and a lot to take in. Um, and so if you don't have questions at this very moment, um, Arun is available. Um, and if you just send me an email with your question, I can forward it along. Um, uh, if you have any questions, though, feel free to star one to now unmute yourself or your line to ask your questions. It's stunned silent. I know, no questions. <laughs> Hi there, it's Julie. Um, I just wanted to confirm, I'm crossing my fingers as I ask this question, um, that the updating of this form, you know, when the evidence changes or the guidelines change, like we, I'm assuming you guys are doing that? Yes. Perfect. And how does it, um, how do you just get those updates to us? So um, when we update the EMR form, we'll have your, uh, Pippi has your email. So we'll email you when there's an update to the form with instructions of how to install it into your system. So um, 
yeah, so we'd only contact, we'd contact you when there's a new update with the new files and the information as to how to upload it into your system to replace the existing files. Perfect. Thank you. Right. Yeah, essentially, the, once you, once this form has been imported into your system, any subsequent forms that are imported under the same name, it essentially overrides the original file. Um, and I think actually you can even go back to ones that were previously used and you can update the encounter with the new note if you wanted to. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Hello, can you hear, hear me? Yes. It's Heidi at the Petawawa Centennial. I'm just wondering if you can clarify the function of the insert previous note um, options that pop up. Sure. Um, uh, what would, uh, what would, is there, is there a particular uh, question you want me to ask, or that you have, or do you want me to sort of just sort of what does it mean or what does it look like? Well, yeah, I'm just wondering if it's just to directly input your previous note, if it's basically, you know, the same assessment. Um, just because I was recently at a um, CME and they were talking, someone was talking from CMTA about being cautious with EMRs and not just duplicating um, notes mm -hmm. um, in terms of liability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, what we have there, of course, is we don't auto-populate it for you. We automatic, we ask if you want to insert the last note. So if the discussion was effectively around the same pieces, so for example, if your discussion centered around uh, incorporating physical activity and exercise, that was the dominant discussion for you at that session, and you're just reinforcing, re-encouraging, uh, what we have there for you is you can insert the last note. You can still edit it. It doesn't mean that it's fixed in space. You can edit and add to it. Uh, so you could say, insert last note, uh, continue to reinforce from last visit. Uh, so that's what the functionality is there for. Absolutely, I think CMTA, uh, their advice and suggestions are probably are paramount in this situation. Uh, what we're doing really is it's about trying to create some additional convenience for you, uh, recognizing that you know each visit isn't going to be necessarily massively different from the other. Again, because a lot of management is incremental for chronic pain. Um, so we're just trying to make it a little bit easier. Okay, great. Thank you. Another I've also heard at a wall oh. that, Sorry? Hello? I was just going to add to that. So I've heard from a couple providers who've used the forums, and what they found has been really helpful with that insert last note is a way to quickly review the last time the patient was in the treatment plan. And then so they would insert the last note, and then they would potentially clear it or insert the stamp text to add their treatment plan for the time. Mm -hmm. That's a great I don't know. Thank you, Pippi. Yeah. Another question from Petawawa. Um, when is it going to be available in Oscar? Is it already available? It is already available in Oscar. So the, we had built the um, webinar around the TELUS platform, but the form and function of the um, one in Oscar is pretty much the exact same. Um, it was just we have more people um, who are piloting with the TELUS form. Um, but yes, for you guys, you will be using it in Oscar. But like I said, the form and function itself is a pretty mirror image. Okay, an addendum to that, does the uh, brief pain inventory PHQ-9 import from Oscar right into this e-form? From, from, oh, from for, Ocean? From Ocean, yes. Yes, yeah, so they are linked. Um, we'll, I will have to double check though, so I think it depends on how the form in your system has been tagged, like in your ocean system, but if you're just using essentially the one that is preloaded on your ocean tablet, yes, it should, it should push to um, the form itself. And so that would also apply to any of our Ocean users who are on TELUS as well. No more questions? <laughs> okay. Uh, like I said, um, if you do have any additional questions, please feel free to email me. Um, 
and I will forward them along to Arun. Um, and like I also said, we will we have recorded this, so I will um, put the file out there for you guys to have um, at your fingertips, as well as for those that weren't able to attend today uh, can review after.